that I had. Nothing give it to me. Oh, yes, that I had. Nothing give it to me. Nothing give it to me. Nothing give it to me. Whenever I'm in the dumps, I come up here and it reaffirms everything that I think is really good and generous about this country. And to have some kid who's been in the hospital for six months out of the year come up and say, this place, this, to come back here is what I live for. Well, pretty potent stuff. In 1988, one of the most innovative camps in the world opened to children with life-threatening illnesses. Paul Newman and an unlikely group of individuals designed and built a camp that would become a model for camps all over the world. This is their story. Everybody grab right. a fork here. Dig in. The Hole in the Wall Gang camp really began with a bottle of salad dressing. The food business generated profit immediately. With the profits escalating, Newman came to me and said, why don't we give all the money to charity? Which elicited a great response from charities all over the country. Pam, have we um, given money this year to Alzheimer's research? Let's have a look. I'm After a, a year or two of giving all this largesse away, Newman one day suggested that we should have a charity of our own. During one of our dinners, he mentioned this idea about building a little camp for children with cancer, and so they could raise a little hell. He was totally enthusiastic, just the same way as he was about the salad dressing. Paul was very aware of cancer in his own family, since his mother and father had both died of cancer. And in typical Newman fashion, instead of taking time to research it, he said, good, let's do it for next summer. What I was trying to do, I think, was to acknowledge luck, extraordinary luck in my lifetime, and, um, and the brutality of luck in the lives of some especially young kids. Newman's dream would prove a unique challenge, how to create a magical camp and yet still provide essential medical services. Envisioned was a camp with the doctor as its heart and soul. Hotchner sought out Yale New Haven's Dr. Howard Pearson. I was the senior pediatric blood doctor in Connecticut. It was a fortuitous time for me because I did have time. I was looking for ways to uh, do something different. I recruited Vince Conti in the camp because I felt we need managerial skills, which none of us had. I got a call from Howard Pearson. And he said, Vince, he said, I, I'm not sure what to make of this, but I just got a call from a guy who said he was Paul Newman. And he wanted to come and talk to us about developing a camp for sick kids, and specifically to see if we could arrange for the health care that he knew that these kids would, would need. He was serious about his intent, but wanted very much to proceed with it in a, uh, in a fanciful way. And that combination I had never seen before. With a strong medical team behind the project, the search for land on which to build the camp began in earnest. The summer of 86 was spent going through a series of campsites. As I realized that we were all a bunch of rank amateurs with respect to camps. In fact, the only one that had any tangible experience with camp was Sam Ross. For 40 years, Dr. Samuel Ross had run the Green Chimney School, which pairs troubled children with injured animals. It was Dr. Ross's son who had put him in touch with Newman's team. David Ross was fighting a losing battle with Hodgkin's disease when he read about Newman's plans. He urged his father to get involved. David said, you know, Dad, you ought to contact him and say, look, uh, I know how to run camps. I've been doing it for a long time, and I want to be of help. Sam Ross would be instrumental advising us about how to have a kitchen, the facilities, what kind of services you must have. 
David Ross never lived to see the camp. He lost his battle with cancer in 1986. But David's wishes remained a driving force for Sam. Distances didn't make a difference. Sam was in Brewster, New York, but he would, he would travel to Westport for these meetings as, on, a drop of a, on a drop of a hat. Looking back on the camp and thinking about David, I think David would be very pleased uh, at how I was involved. The search for suitable land continued throughout 1986, when Ursula received a fateful phone call from the realtor. A real estate person called me up and said, I think I have a good place here. We went up there and I said, oh my God, I found it. The lake was huge, there were wildflowers everywhere, but there were no roads, no electricity. It was just pure land. The sweeping 344-acre site located in rural Northeast Connecticut had been owned by the Harakali family since the 1940s. The Harakalis had farmed the land for years, but by the late 60s, family farms were no longer economically viable in the Northeast. So George Harakali and his father bulldozed most of the buildings and put the land up for sale. My impression was that it was gorgeous, that it was a wonderful place to have a summer camp, and that eventually we could make it into a place that was absolutely accessible and friendly. We had two or three public hearings before the Zoning Commission. One of the things they kept harping about was the taxes they were going to lose. We are going to lose taxes on that property for one thing, and I still have to know from the selectmen or what, how we're going to benefit by it. So what we did was agree to pay them an equivalent of taxes as a contribution. And conferring with uh, Mr. Newman and his principals today, they said that certainly they'd be willing to consider some payments in lieu of taxes so that the project will be uh, expenditure neutral for the town of Ashford. I'm just proud that he's even coming to this town. But if the plans for the camp were to gain nationwide exposure, Newman's celebrity would not be enough. Operating out of the Newman's own offices, Ursula Gwynn worked tirelessly to get the word out. Ursula was right at the head of that parade. She knew how to get things done and how to, how to make sure that uh, when you led in an initiative, the public was back there following you. Actor Paul Newman announced today that he is sponsoring the first summer camp in the state for children with cancer and other life-threatening diseases. At Yale New Haven Hospital, which will oversee the camp's medical programs, Newman shed his movie Tough Guy image to say the idea for the facility was prompted by personal knowledge of young victims of cancer. Maybe it was the loss of some friends of mine to cancer, young men. And uh, it was all cumulative. I don't know where it came from. It simply was there one morning. If you were to uh, have a uh, fantasy of what a summer camp should be like uh, with no restraints as far as space or money or facilities, this will be that. Once we were able to determine that there weren't any showstoppers from the town's perspective, then I think the next step was to get serious about designing the camp and actually getting on with building it. Conti would not have to go far to find one of America's leading architects to head the project. Tom Beebe was dean of the architecture school at Yale University. From the very beginning, Paul was interested in the idea that this would be a western town. I was trying to sort through that as an idea, an architectural idea. It seemed like a curious idea to do in Connecticut. We did an initial scheme that was more like a camp. I mean, it actually had a kind of main building where that town center was. And Paul's reaction wasn't good. I mean, he thought it was too institutional looking. It became clear that he wanted something that was extremely freewheeling and not in any way orthodox. These kids are spend their time in hospitals. They're institutionalized a lot of their time, and you have to make this completely uninstitutional. Although it obviously had a medical aspect to it, it had to not look like it. This town was this kind of fantasy place where kids go, and they forget their past, they forget the medical problems they have, and they lead a different life here. The concept of the camp was not the only unique aspect. So was the deadline. Was there a 
Tom and his team of architects would have less than a year to design over 30 buildings. We'd never done anything this ad hoc or this kind of fast. We used to meet in restaurants in uh, Westport. We'd create this enormous scene in these restaurants where people eat dinner. We'd have the drawings all rolled, unrolled on the floor, talk through the buildings, eat dinner at the same time, get back in the car and drive back to New Haven and draw them up again. Actor, director, and salad dressing mogul Paul Newman helped break ground today for a summer camp for seriously ill children. May the good Lord hallow this ground and the people who come to dwell here. What we're going to do up here is going to be a joyous transformation. I think it's going to finally wind up to be a statement of people's generosity. This was land that had been untouched, and we were going to turn it over to children. And that was a great emotional moment. But the groundbreaking ceremony in late 1986 was purely symbolic. Although Conover Construction had been contracted to build the camp, millions of dollars would need to be raised before construction could begin. It would take Newman's enduring optimism to keep the project on track. It was like Newman was behind the wheel of a race. He was just gung-ho. He didn't even know how much it's going to cost him. It was like uh, you have a dream and you want to do it, but uh, nobody knew what exactly we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Because of Newman's commitment to getting this done, we did not wait for a successful capital campaign. It was all systems go from day one. We're going to raise this money. There's no question about it. And if there was, we're going to build it anyways. We began to get an outpouring of contributions from school children all over the country. They would stage bikeathons and bakeathons, and kids who said, This summer I operated a lemonade stand and I made $5.40 and I want to send it to the camp. But it would take much more than lemonade money to build the camp. To qualify for nonprofit status, at least half the money would have to come from a source other than Paul Newman. In the summer of 1987, Khaled Alhejalan, a young Saudi living in Washington, D.C., heard of Newman's plans. Khaled had been suffering from a rare blood disorder since birth. I thought it was important for him to meet Newman because he was at an age where he could articulate how important it would have been for him to go to a camp. So I brought him to Newman's own. I think we were there an hour and a half, and uh, he just told his story to Newman, and it was just the most fascinating story you could possibly hear uh, from what was obviously an extraordinary, extraordinary human being. He talked about the camp, and he looked at the model, and he said that um, how much something like this would have meant to him if he'd had it. And as he was leaving, he turned to Newman and said, because I am a Saudi, I uh, have the opportunity to petition my king uh, for requests, and I intend to try to ask him, uh, ask him for a gift to the whole of camp. Two weeks later, Khaled called with good news. The major donation the camp so desperately needed would come from the government of Saudi Arabia. Paul called me up and he said, how much money do you think we're getting? I said, 50. And he said, 5 million. He said, the only thing that you have to do is come down and pick up the check. I said, I'll be down there in an instant. We flew down there a few days later. We had a wonderful reception at the embassy. We got onto Newman's plane with a check for $5 million. At one point, Newman turned to me and said, do we go to Mexico or do we go back to Connecticut? With the money in hand, construction of the camp was underway by the fall of 1987. There would be no time to spare, as Newman insisted that the first campers arrive just nine months later. To say that people uh, like me uh, and others were nervous about that kind of aspiration that it was, is, is an unbelievable understatement. Nobody believed it could happen, with the exception of Paul. It was build and design all at once. The pace of the project meant that we and the design team had to work hand in hand. Mike Kolakowski was 
26 years old when Simon Conover assigned to him the job of heading up the construction project. To the elder Newman, Mike seemed a curious choice. We were in paralysis of fear that the thing would not get built in time. And I called Simon. I said, you sent a child up here to do a man's work. He says, wait. He didn't have a lot of experience, but he had a great spirit. He was like a bulldog. He's going to get the thing done no matter what. He figured out how to, how to build that thing sequentially in a way that didn't sort of make sense on paper, but it made sense the way he built it. So he finished buildings as he went, and then he'd move on to the next building. I mean, that was the way to do it. I mean, I think he was very resourceful. That resourcefulness would be tested during the harsh winter conditions of 1987 and 88, one of the worst on record. This camp was started in the fall and they wanted it ready to open in the spring and uh, God sent snow and God sent ice and God sent cold. I made a deal with the log cabin uh, manufacturer that we needed to take some of the people from Canada. And there was five gentlemen that came to Connecticut, lived in trailers on site. One guy picked the logs up, put them down, another guy drove the spikes, another guy put the sealant, um, another guy, you know, used the chainsaw. It was unbelievable. We couldn't find people locally that could produce like that. Mike could also count on Newman during that winter. After receiving 14 inches of snow one night in early December, Paul called Mike at the work site to see how he could help. He says, well, I want to do something special for the guys. I said, well, Maybe we should have a party or something here at, at the uh, camp. He said, no, I don't, want, I don't want it at the camp. I want it off camp, and I want to provide the biggest steaks we can provide, uh, as much beer as the guys can drink. So we would go all the way up there, and Paul would go around and, and greet them all and tell them what a great job they were doing, and he was their cheerleader. I think Newman signed more autographs than he signed in his lifetime. To this day, the workers talk about he and Hotch and the way they really appreciated the effort that all the guys gave. It was almost week to week that you couldn't recognize the place, that it was um, uh, literally a transformation. The log cabins sort of arose from the, the, the ground as if by magic. The cafeteria, which is a, a, probably the, a, the centerpiece of the camp, wasn't there one week, and the next week it was there. In a way, we were all like transported into being like little kids building sandcastles or something because it all had an unreal aspect to it. It has this kind of sheer, pure imagination applied to a building process. And Sam Ross was very helpful during this, uh, this whole period too because he had considerable insights and expertise. If you look at it, you can see that it spread out over a, a, quite a few acres. I was concerned uh, as an educator now uh, how would these children, where would the children go to the bathroom? I was constantly looking at the building and saying, where's the bathroom, where's the bathroom? I became known as the toilet man. As winter turned to spring, the construction crew battled a new enemy on the job site, mud. This kind of became this mud bath. It was it was almost impossible to get around. I remember, I still remember, they were, as they finished the buildings up, they wrapped them up in this screen because they all get slopped with mud with passing vehicles. I can remember going home and being covered in mud and walking down to a jo to one of the buildings and losing your boots. I was horrified. This beautiful piece of land, it looked horrendous, overwhelming. I thought they ruined it. It wasn't till mid-May when. Everything started to dry out and the rain stopped that the roads and the paths and everything became dry. As we got nearer to what we had planned to be the opening date, it seemed unlikely that we could have it done. I discussed with Newman maybe putting off the opening of the camp. So no, nope, you don't put it off. We just redouble our efforts to get it done. In order to meet the June 4th deadline, construction crews worked around the clock, seven days a week. The Eagles went aside and 
The objective was to get it complete. As long as the communication lines are open, everyone is positive and moving ahead as a group. You can do anything in building. And uh, this is structured to do that. It had the right personalities, the impetus was there. Ever present was Paul Newman. As the deadline loomed, Paul spent an increasing amount of time at the job site. He was totally involved. He knew every finish, every the hardware went by, everything went by, every detail went by him, and he approved it all. When budget concerns threatened to delay the construction of the Olympic-sized pool, local contractors came up with an innovative plan. The Swimming Pool Association of Connecticut decided they'd make a project out of it. So all of the swimming, major swimming pool people came together. One guy came in and dug the hole, one poured in the cement, one put the tiles in, and it was just a labor of love. We saw people who were competitive on a daily basis really unite and become one to, for a purpose. At the end, when it was all finished, we had a priest, a rabbi, and a minister blessing the pool. We have a whole event. It was just a celebration of the pool. We thought that if we told the world we had this camp, parents and hospitals would be besieging us with um, requests. The fact was, nobody was knocking on our door. By the spring of 1988, less than 50 of a potential 90 children had signed up for the first session. The shakedown crews would be only half full. We had more staff that first session than we had kids. And we were asking kids, we were inviting them to stay session after session so that we would have the beds filled, you know. Parents were not gonna send their sick kids to a, to a place uh, that had a movie star connected to it, but uh, did not have any credentials. As the dedication approached, landscaping was put in to repair the trampled grounds, and final touches were applied to the buildings. Everyone pitched in to help, including the new staff. Most of orientation was picking up nails and scrubbing the gummy off the toilets, just getting the site ready. And the smell was awesome. The smell was just wood, wood everywhere. It poured. It was a miserable morning. And I remember driving around with uh, wood chips just to make sure that the puddles didn't cause problems. You never had the sense right up until the, the, probably the hour the first kids arrived that we were ready. But uh, somehow the kids arrived and the camp was absolutely ready. The camp facility was ready, the camp staff was ready. The bulldozers left and the children came in and we were busy taking care of kids <laughs> on that first June day. There, it was uh, more an uh, initiation uh, into fire than rather a dedication. We just went to work. Thank you. We are kind of witness to a mini miracle here. Uh, there wasn't anything above ground here uh, on August 1st of last year. And in nine months, there are 35 buildings. Uh, it was a terrible winter, a lot of rain. <laughs> but <clears throat> we were lucky enough to avoid today. Uh, but it's, the, listen, the roof is not leaking. Isn't that wonderful? That first day when children actually came to the camp and parents and we celebrated the event, it was memorable. Yeah. It was overwhelming, I must say. It, that obviously brought it to a close. When you see these children, they laugh, they yell and scream, dancing around and carrying on. You just forget that they are very ill at the moment. It's lovely because they're at peace. I'd never really been away before, and my parents are um, very kind, very loving people, but also very sheltering. 
and they said this will be good for you and they left uh, feeling I guess like the worst parents in the entire world. And I called home and according to my mom the conversation was to the effect, hi mom having a great time probably won't call again, click. <laughs> and, that, and that was it. It was Newman's drive that built that camp. That whole belief and the absolute refusal to accept any kind of rebuff, that was Newman. When he toasted the staff, I remember him saying, I brought camp to this point, I've taken it this far, now you, you take it the rest of the way. Paul makes it possible for other people to make a contribution. I think personally, uh, this was a wonderful opportunity to have. I've grown in this opportunity. I mean, when you talk to him, there's this kind of sense of life is really serious, but you can't take it too seriously. And I, I think that in the end, that fed its way into the camp. It has far exceeded everybody's expectations, including Newman's. So when I heard this is going to be a great place for kids to raise a little hell and, you know, whatever, I thought that's great, that's fun. We far underestimated what effect that would have on their health and on their spirit and on their willingness to fight to keep alive so that they can come back for another summer session. When I started 16 years ago, I felt that I would be a consultant dropping in periodically during the course of the summer and have spent uh, the better part of uh, 16 summers in Ashford. There's a reward that is much more than you put into it. What happens here transcends the logs of the cabins and the water in the lake. It is where alchemy and magic live. The Hole in the Wall gang camp sits, newly risen from a dream, a testament to man's aspirations fulfilled. There was a story early on, Life magazine did. The one part of that story that I remember most clearly is a picture of the group that was so involved in the creation of the camp. And as I look at that picture, what strikes me is that every one of them uh, brought a, a special blend of background, expertise, knowledge, viewpoint on things. But what they shared in common was a zeal, a, a fire in the belly about children. <laughs>